Hi, my name is Biram Ekpara, and I am a cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery specialist at Wells Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. When it comes to looking for markers of dry eye disease, there are a lot of things we can look at, especially in the commercial space. But honestly, for me, the most important thing that we start with is a slit lamp exam. Anytime I encounter a patient with dry eye, I take a pretty systematic approach. So we start from the outside and go in. So we'll look at the lids and lashes first, look for blepharitis or meibomian gland dysfunction. Then we'll look at lid closure or incomplete blinks to see if there's any signs of exposure. And then we start looking at the surface of the eye. So the conjunctiva first, looking for conjunctival chalasis. And I often like to put stain on the conjunctiva with lysamine green. Oftentimes that'll show us some really dry eye. And then finally, we look at the cornea and look at how the cornea reacts to fluorescein stain, whether we pick up staining or if we have a decreased tear breakup time. So I do think that starting out, really the, the gold standard when it comes to evaluating dry eye is a good exam, a good systematic exam. But there are diagnostic, more objective things out there that we use. And this is what we generally refer to as biomarkers. So the first one that's out there is something that looks at MMP9 levels in the tears. So it's called the Inflamadry. And this is something we do use at Wills. And it, it gives kind of a binary answer. So you, you, you test the tears and it'll look for or elevated levels of MMP9. And we know that elevated levels of MMP9 are seen in dry eye. It's a hallmark of inflammation, and we know that dry eye is an inflammatory condition. So basically, uh, you take this test on a patient, and it'll come back as, as yes or no. It's almost like a pregnancy test. And it gives us a nice objective sign, especially if we're not really sure if the patient has dry eye or not, and we kind of want to have some sort of objective confirmatory test. It's a useful tool. The other thing that we look for is tear osmolarity. And this is something that, that we've kind of had from the get-go. And we know that elevated levels of tear osmolarity are seen in dry eye disease. So the, the level that we use as a marking point or as a, as a standard is 300. So if a patient has a tear osmolarity above 300, that is a sign of dry eye disease. Where I really find this useful though, is I get a baseline measurement in a patient, and then we start treatment with various anti-inflammatory medications. And we can actually follow those levels and hopefully those levels are coming down. And that provides us a useful tool to see if our treatment is working but it also gives the patient kind of something to look forward to because a lot of times dry eye it's a long-term treatment it's a chronic treatment sometimes patients is frustrated so if you can show them hey look your, your levels are coming down you may not be feeling that much better quite yet but you're getting better it, it just kind of gives them a nice piece of encouragement um, the last thing when it comes to kind of objective measurements there's a lot of devices now that look at my momian gland structure and my momian gland, Im gland imaging and it, it's a way you know you can sort of tell this on exam but these devices really light up abnormal glands or maybe the patient has completely normal glands, but it's a great way to image the glands. And again, it's another way to educate our patients so we can show our patients, hey, look, your glands aren't that healthy. You're missing some glands and, and we got to get on this before you know we reach the point of no return. So we, we, do, we do live in a nice time where there's a lot of neat objective measurements that we can use for both diagnosis, but also education and monitoring. Now, during this pandemic, we've been at home, we've been on computers, we're on a Zoom call right now. And, and these activities, I do think, have increased the amount of, of dry that we're seeing or hearing about. Specifically in our younger patients, I, I'm seeing more and more patients, maybe in their 20s or 30s this last year, complaining of you know, dry symptoms and, and specifically maybe contact lens intolerance. And you know, they're on their screens eight, 10, 12 hours a day. And even before the pandemic, you know, we, we now live in a smartphone culture. We're always on our phones. I'm guilty of it. And and just constant screen time, I do think is is making the prevalence of dry eye go up, especially in patients that maybe we wouldn't normally expect to see it in.